All right. Well, welcome to Nickel Point. Um, I'm here with Chris Murray, who's, uh, who's our brewer. My name is Bruce Corrigan. I'm the CEO and the head brewer here at Nickel Point Brewing Company. And we're here to talk a about a brand new beer that we just released last week that we're it's extremely really excited about. Um, we call it the Raspberry Wild Siren Sour Ale. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit, Chris and I are going to talk a little bit about how we made the beer, a little bit about the recipe and the yeast and kind of some unique things that we did during uh, uh, fermentation and uh, to, to make the beer. Uh, but m most importantly, also tell you where you can get it. Um, so, so let's just sort of dive in here. I, you know, the, the yeast, we, we started experimenting with this product last year. We did a, a version that was unfruited. Um, we called it the Wild Siren. So hopefully you'll start to pick up on the fact that this is going to be a series. Um, this year we decided to fruit it with raspberries. But we use a very unique yeast strain in this beer. Uh, it's called Lachancia. It's actually a wild type strain that uh, was isolated, harvested and isolated from a bumblebee of all things. And um, it does some really unique things during, during fermentation. Um, depending on how it's propagated and prepared, it can actually produce its own lactic acid during, during primary fermentation. So it's a little unique in that sense that we're actually able to produce a fairly balanced medium tart sour beer without having to introduce bacteria into our process, which is a, is a big deal. Um, if, if we put uh, lactobacillus or pediococcus, Chris would be here uh, uh, yeah, day and night, right? Cleaning. All <laughs> Cleaning. the time. Cleaning. All the time. So yeah. it, it's really a unique strain that, um, that uh, yields some really unique flavors. Um, but it does some interesting things during primary fermentation. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about kind of, you know, a typical fermentation with this yeast and kind of what makes it a little bit unique. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's very different compared to all other sort of standard brewer's yeasts that are out there. Um, the way it attenuates, it, uh, it essentially has a lag up front and it, it spends about two days uh, just producing lactic acid for us. And um, as soon as it's come down and the pH drops fairly significantly over those two days, um, it'll start to attenuate and then and it sort of is like a roller coaster ride down and it goes down you know 20 25 units and then it stalls out for a few more days and it produces a little bit more lactic acid and it looks like you're in trouble and you don't know what's going to happen then and then all of a sudden it starts to attenuate again and goes down to terminal and uh, has a slow ride down uh, to there all in all it takes what about 25 27 days right um, almost a month yeah. to get it to finish yeah. out which is so. kind of unique um, so, so we used a, a fairly straightforward malt bill and hot bill um, we really wanted the yeast to be the showcase um, in this beer and so why don't you talk just a little bit about, you know, the, the malts and the hops that we used. Sure. Um, um, the malt build is, uh, is very basic. It's primarily just a brewer's malt in there with a few other things. And then uh, uh, hop-wise, we used Willamette and Liberty. And uh, those we came out at 10 IBUs on. We wanted to make sure that that was very, very minimal and just sort of enhanced a little bit of the flavor in the beer itself and really let the yeast do the showcasing along with the raspberries. Yeah, cool. Now, so here at Nickel Point, we, we uh, pride ourselves in some of the scientific capabilities that we've got. And so we were always doing test batches. And we did a whole series of test batches when we decided to fruit the beer. And what we found is that when you give... Um, or put fruit in the wort at, on brew day, so you're introducing all that sugar that the yeast is going to consume on brew day, that it would actually consume those sugars from the, from the fruit immediately and then kind of say, we're done and go dormant. And so we had to get a little creative, didn't we? A little creative on how we were going to add the fruit to the beer. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah. So uh, a lot of those early test batches that we did with this was, was figuring out when we could add that raspberry so that it would still attenuate everything and we wouldn't have any stability issues. Um, and uh, what we found out was essentially when it gets about ooh, 10 points away from terminal, then we could inject that raspberry into the beer itself. Uh, the yeast was still acting enough that it ate all those sugars, so that wasn't a problem at all. And it still went down to the terminal gravity that we were expecting and that we saw last year in and the other mm -hmm. test batches right. as well. And but, the reason yeah. that was mainly important for us this year is because, as you can see, we planned to put it in package. And so we wanted to make sure the product was stable, that we didn't have any yeast taking off in a secondary fermentation on the shelf. And so um, we got a little creative on how we were going to handle that. Yeah. So, 
Which kind of leads me to the, to the last thing here is, as you, as you can see here, we, we did package the beer into cans. We sell it um, in six uh, pack, 12 ounce format. Um, Look for it in any of your local bottle shops here in the area um, and, and some of the restaurants too. It's not quite, uh, you won't see it on the shelves at your Harris Teeter and your Lowe's Foods like you typically see the IPA in the Vienna. Um, we, we miss the spring reset, but, uh, but you can get it if you don't see it at, at your local bottle shop, etc. Be sure to ask for it. They can certainly, certainly get it. So. So that's a little bit about the, wild, the Raspberry Wild Sire and Sour Ale. Um, thanks for your time and uh, cheers. cheers.